This video is brought to you in part by Raycon. More on them in a bit. It's been a little bit since I last talked about Ratchet and Clank here, because it turns out spending like two years working on a 9 million hour retrospective series makes you not want to play the games for a little while. Please God, stop asking me about the PSP games, I have a family! Now I fully expected that I would burn out on these games as part of my work, that's just what tends to happen when you're playing a dozen games, essentially back to back to back to back, etc, with multiple playthroughs of the games, each before moving on to the next one. What I didn't expect, though, was to fall in love with the first Ratchet & Clank game all over again so quickly afterwards. Enter the Ratchet & Clank Randomizer, a sort of not really mod for the PS3 version of this first game that does what it says on the tin. It randomizes the weapons and gadgets you'll collect in each level or in the vendors, and it randomizes what planet's coordinates you'll obtain when you find an infobot, all in a package where every single seed is completely finishable without needing any of the high-level speedrun strategies or glitches. You heard that right, a rare randomizer without soft locks, well, m mostly, we'll get there, and one that works with normal or quote-unquote casual play. Since not many people really talk about RNC online, you may not even know that this existed, or you might know about it because I mentioned it a couple times in community posts when I shared playthroughs over on my second channel. And that's why I want to talk about the randomizer here on the main channel today, because not only is it the single driving factor behind me even wanting to think about Ratchet so soon after finishing up my series retrospective, not only did it give me a renewed love and appreciation for the first game after my dozens of playthroughs over the years, it, like everything in this series, has a really fascinating behind the scenes, and how this randomizer works is in one of the coolest ways I've ever seen with a game mod. So let's talk about this mod, some of my experiences with it, and of course you know me well enough by this point, we're going to dig into its development too. This is the story of the Ratchet & Clank randomizer. Now, first things first, I am not going to tell you specifically how to install this mod. This is not a how-to guide, because that's not my role, and it involves, at the very least, installing custom firmware onto your PS3, the process for which is different for each model of PS3. PlayStation hasn't really shown any indication that it cares about this sort of modding as long as you're legally purchasing products, and at this point the PS3 is obviously a legacy console, but any sort of modding puts your PSN account at risk for a permanent ban. Also, there's a strong chance that numerous PlayStation staffers see this video. I've heard I have fans there, and also, they tend to keep tabs on me since they send me review codes when I request them. So, uh, hi, hi PlayStation. Uh, don't ignore, pretend you didn't watch this video if you would be upset by it as a, as a company. Also, bring back Kevin Butler, thank you. In other words, I'm hoping that this does not rock that PlayStation doesn't care that much about PS3 modding boat, because that would suck, and I would feel bad. Also, I've modded my PS3, so... They know where they know where I live. Um, if you're going to go through with installing this randomizer and going through the whole process, I suggest completely wiping your PSN account from that PlayStation 3 just to be safe, which is what I actually did. I needed a second PS3 to replace my old fatty anyway. It's it's gonna die any day now probably. What I will tell you is that the Ratchet & Clank randomizer has a place that goes over the details more about how to install this mod using a legally purchased copy of the game, a bit of an FAQ, and a place where they can try to help you set up. And, with the developer's permission, I'm linking that in the description and the pinned comment as long as that community stays up. Hopefully, again, this doesn't, um... Yeah, I figure there might be a lot of new faces in that server after this video, so please be patient and nice. They're very cool folks over there. Before I run through one of my playthroughs to show you how neat the experience can be, I want to share a bit about the randomizer's development, because it's such a neat solution to some uniquely RNC problems. Why am I saying neat so much? What am I, 90? The bulk of the work on this randomizer mod was done by someone who goes by the name Boardplate, and they were kind enough to take a bit of time out of their day to chat with me about how this mod works. If you remember the more nitty-gritty production details from my deep dives into the PS2 Ratchet games, you'll probably recall that these games were often made with some duct tape, bubblegum, and a lot of hope. A ton of the development tricks that Insomniac utilized on Ratchet 1-3 especially, stuff like dipping into that extra bit of memory tucked away in the PS1 chipset used for PS1 backwards compatibility, 
Fidelity, for example, are what made those games so difficult to port to PS3. It's what made the PS2 on PS3 disc backwards compatibility spotty on some of the backwards compatible PS3 models. It's 100% why those games never came out on PS4 by the way of the PS2 Classics run, because if Jack's PS2 on PS4 ports were worse than the PS3 versions, you can imagine how bad Ratchet would have been. This is also why there hasn't exactly been much in the world of Ratchet & Clank modding, because modifying any element of these early games is very likely to break a lot of things elsewhere. So instead, the biggest Ratchet & Clank mod that exists focused on locating specific addresses in the game's memory and targeting those to help make the speedrunning game a bit more intuitive. This quote-unquote mod is called RAC Man, or Rack Man, and it's not actually a mod in the traditional sense, it's a program you run on your computer that links over your local network to your PS3 thanks to the latter's custom firmware options, and in the simplest terms, it injects a text file with a number of small memory address changes into the Ratchet HD collection, rather than truly modifying any part of the game's code. Keep this in mind when we get to the randomizer part. For speedrunners, what this means is that you can click through some options on this program to give yourself certain weapons on any level. You can instantly kill Ratchet to reset the checkpoint. You can auto-load yourself onto a specific planet so that, I, I don't know, you don't have to play the entire game over and over again every time you want to practice late game tech. And there are even some tricks in place that let you activate something called Ghost Ratchet. Ghost Ratchet is a speedrun exploit that makes the game think that Ratchet's dead, essentially letting you no-clip through any walls and opening up some really wild infinite jump tricks that I I've only been able to do like once or twice. A, a speedrunner, I am not. It's the kind of stuff that helps open up the speedrun game for a wider potential audience, and eventually Boardplate started messing around with adding an item and level randomizer into this program, first purely for speedrunners, and then later with the help of two other folks named Myth197 and Alidos5, the door was opened for anybody to be able to play this randomizer, no tricks required. Well, one trick, sorta. Again, I'll go into that later. At first, putting together this randomizer meant locating the exact memory addresses for every weapon, gadget, and info bot in the game, and then quickly, it also meant putting together a couple fast fixes that you would probably never consider. For example, if in Ratchet 1 you somehow got the thruster pack upgrade before getting the original helipack, it wouldn't function until you had the helipack too. Or for another example that at the time of recording hasn't been touched yet is that health upgrade soda machine on planet Orkson. If you don't have the first health upgrade, it won't let you make that second vendor purchase because having that fifth hit point is the flag to enable purchasing what would be the second health upgrade. But since this is a randomizer, you can also get the Ultra Health upgrade that gives you three more hit points before getting that fifth one, and that causes your health bar to look kind of funky. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. Eventually, after a ton of brute force work, manually logging all of the solvable item combos that would allow you to finish a run without a soft lock or needing to use a speedrun strat, the Ratchet & Clank randomizer was fully functional for any player, so long as you're playing on the digital PAL slash European region version of Ratchet 1 on the PS3. Why that very specific version? Well, that's the one that's the preferred PS3 speedrun version, thanks to an oversight on the part of the HD remaster team back when they ported this to PS3 in 2012. If you're this far into such a niche video, you're probably familiar with how Europe's electricity standards run at a frequency of 50 Hz, and how the US and Japan run at 60 Hz. This is why games for a long time ran at 50 frames per second in European region copies, or more accurately, they ran at 5 sixths of the frame rate, so 25 instead of 30 FPS, or in some N64 games like Zelda, you folks in Europe got a whopping 17 FPS instead of the blitzing 20 we got here. Wow. Some games just actually ran slower, others adapted so that the experience was the same regardless of the frame rate. but by the PS2 days, some titles like Ratchet & Clank actually gave you the option in PAL regions to play at either 50 or 60 FPS regardless of your TV's refresh rate. Nowadays, this isn't really a thing anymore because TV standards, well, well they, they standardized across regions as time went on thanks to analog televisions being phased out for digital ones. However, this part, I think, is the important one for Ratchet. As far as I understand it, one tiny oversight meant that the Pyrocitor Flamethrower still updated 50 times per second when the game was remastered, even though the remaster only ever runs at 60. And somehow that disparity led to this gun dealing insane amounts of damage if you're right up against an enemy. 
as in a kill bosses in seconds level of damage, which of course makes this the fastest way to finish the game, and therefore the speedrun version and the one modders focus on. I actually bought this version back when I raced my good buddy Chris Mykonos fan in Ratchet 1 vs Ratchet PS4 for a charity race, just in case I, I needed an edge by the end of the race because I was playing the longer game. I would have won anyway it turns out, so I, I just kinda wasted $10, but then I found out about the randomizer so it still worked out. According to Boardplate, a European disc version of RNC's HD collection should also work with this randomizer since the memory addresses are only going to be different based on region and not from disc to digital, but the rest of the Rackman program wouldn't work besides the randomizer, so it's maybe a little bit iffy. Likewise, if somebody went through the hassle of looking through the North American version of Ratchet 1, it would technically be possible to make this randomizer work regardless of region or via PS3 emulation, and again, the same is hypothetically true for the PS2 original game, but that's just a whole other set of work to be done as well. So really, if you want to play the randomizer, just prepare to make a UK PSN account and load some money onto it. There are a couple other notes that we'll go into as I run you through one of my randomizer playthroughs, but we'll get there when we get to them. The big one is that the mod multiplies the amount of bolts you receive, so that you're not just potentially stuck being unable to buy anything without grinding if you, for example, get a late game weapon in the shop early. As somebody who once gave the shady rhino salesman 150,000 bolts in this mod only to get the f***ing taunter, I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, watch this. I mean, why pay that much of a premium on something that blasts noise in your ears when you could save some money and get better quality at buyraycon.com slash TGB? I wasn't even going to put this sponsor at this part in the video, but that seg was off the cuff. That one's, that one's free. Everybody needs a good, reliable pair of earbuds, and Raycon's got you covered with its everyday earbud line, rocking quality audio at half the price of other premium brands. These bad boys have got a number of distinct sound profiles that you can play with to fit to your tastes, whether it's a stronger bass profile, balanced audio, or a pure setting to let you hear every single note. Mm, you hear that? That's music. On top of that, it's got a great noise isolation mode and an awareness mode too, so that you can still keep track of what's going on around you while you're rocking out or whatever. With a comfortable snug fit and that noise isolation mode working hand in hand, I'm editing this video right now and I can't even hear my intrusive thoughts. I've been using my Raycons as my daily driver when at my computer lately, as well as at the gym, and it's been super nice not having to plug these in to charge constantly like some other earbuds out there. These ones offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life, so they almost always last longer than even my controller's charge would when I'm recording gameplay footage or just playing something to relax. If you're looking for a great new pair of earbuds and all of that sounds up your alley and you want to help support the channel too, click the link in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com slash TGB to get 15% off your order. Thanks to Raycon for their support on this video, and now, let's get back to it. So Ratchet's randomizer will start out just like you expect. Our heroes meet each other on Veldin, Ratchet has the bomb glove to start, you have to change the camera inversions if you're a sane person because this game has them backwards, and then, once Ratchet and Clank get into the ship, things start to get fun. Since the current version of the randomizer only generates solvable seeds, there are only a handful of levels you can possibly go to first. By solvable seed for the record, I mean that when you load up the current version of this randomizer, it will always be set so that you can beat the game by normal gameplay. You you may have to bounce around between levels or come back when you have some of the items you need to progress as if this was some kind of metroidvania, but you'll never just lose simply because the trespasser is stuck behind a trespasser puzzle or something. Since you have zero tools at the start of the adventure, your first level after the intro is going to have to be one of a small handful. It must be a level that contains the coordinates to at least one more level, and it also must be one that is either completable without any gadgets, or that can give you the gadget you need before you get to a part in that level where you need it. Usually that's going to mean you either go to one of the early levels before you would normally have any of the Clank Helipack upgrades, the stormy Ratchet-only level on Ultanis, since again, you don't need Clank for that one, Hoven, which, let me tell you, is a nightmare scenario if you don't get lucky and get another weapon right away because fighting this first helicopter with only the wrench takes FOREVER, or my least favorite option, the Clank-only section on Orkson. Guess which one I got for this particular playthrough that I recorded and streamed for Ratchet's 20th birthday. I, I really wish that I would have done this for his 21st because this run really made me want to drink at first. See, the reason I'm not a fan of this being level 1 is because the Magna Boots that Clank gets partway through your first trip here will very often be the O2 Mask, which immediately forces you out of playing just as Clank and into playing as Ratchet and, and Clank. 
Since the only item you'll have is the O2 mask, you won't have the ability to glide yet, and that means that you can't do the ratchet part of the level, and since you teleport down to the ship the very moment you finish the Magna Boot cutscene, because now you're playing as Ratchet in this case, you sometimes get lucky and the elevator doesn't realize this and doesn't come down, which means you're kind of stuck here. This is just about the closest thing to a soft lock you can get on the randomizer, barring your game just straight up crashing mid-playthrough. Now, that said, you can normally buy a weapon on Planet Orkson. In a regular playthrough, that would be the Visibomb gun. Here, it could be pretty much anything, so it's worth looking in the vendor to see if we'll get anything that'll help. It's... it's the swing shot. Not currently much help, because we can't get to the part where you would need the swing shot on this level, so that's... that's great. Also, in this case, for some reason, going into the vendor, moved the elevator back up and closed the gate, so... Uh, this is one of the two specific instances where there would technically be a soft lock. I lied. But thankfully, that Rackman program that's fueling this entire randomizer has that no clip ghost ratchet button that I mentioned earlier. So, with a simple click of a button, we can just clip through the closed gate that's supposed to be open, and actually, even in other runs, this one Gadgetbot door in particular doesn't tend to open even if you're doing the clank section normally, so you're probably gonna need to hit the ghost button one more time here, no matter what you're doing. Beyond that, we're done cheating for the rest of the run, and we don't even have to look at our computer anymore. Where are we going next? Hmm. Better not let Ratchet see this one. Since the randomizer, again, doesn't exactly change the actual game code, things like cutscenes or the Magna Boots floating as I showed you earlier, those won't change in-game to the correct cutscene or item model. Instead, after the fact, the text box that pops up will give you the correct item or the coordinates that you received. But we're here in Metropolis now, where we can buy the Magna Boots in the vendor for a hefty zero bolts. Hey, I'll, I'll take that. Any item you would usually receive for free in-game is going to be free if it ends up in the vendor, which is a pretty nice bonus. And unlike some of my more difficult runs I've experienced, we actually got double lucky here, because completing Helga's training course gave me the chance to buy the Metal Detector. Although this might usually be the most mid-item in a normal playthrough, with the mod's bolt multiplier, it means that we're never going to have to worry about money again. Actually, this entire level treated me pretty nicely on this particular playthrough, because Al sold me the thruster pack, which he kind of has to, because you need either the helipack or the thruster pack to actually get past this section of the game, so if you don't have one, he's gonna sell you one, and the infobot after the train section past this led me to Novalis, the game's usual level one. So they may have taken my ship away, but that's okay because we got the pilot's helmet in the vendor, which is, is, is just incredible timing. A fun fact, by the way, playing this level with Clank's glide ability means that you can just skip the entire first half of the level like so. Saving the mayor gives us access to a ship as always, and also gives us the coordinates to planet Pokotaru since I have the pilot's helmet and therefore could do that fighter jet section, and the plumber gave me what's currently a dead end on planet Eudora, unless that level gives me the trespasser. And I'm glad that I was able to... I got some great for you. Hello, guys. This is what the randomizer is. They're just giving you every... I... They're not giving you a gun. I, I wonder <laughs> if they'll attack me. Are you going to hurt me? I'm your friend. Come here. Hi. Okay, so that one didn't work out too well in our favor, but we still have the suck cannon to go to, and again, if you have the thruster pack, f*** your level design, you can just fly through and skip past it, and also, I still have infinite money. The f***ing code bot! <laughs> the f***ing most worthless goddamn thing! Alright. Okay, so, yeah, I can't get the info bot here for now, because I don't remember the in-game trick to clip through that wall, and I'm not cheating outside of using those two bugged walls earlier, so onward to Pokotaru, please, dear god, give me any sort of go- if you've never played this level bomb only, I, I don't recommend it. I did at least give it a shot before immediately giving up and going back to finish Ratchet's part of Orkson. Here, I made Ratchet drink so much soda that he got the Hydro Displacer, which I guess somehow makes some level of sense, and finishing the level unlocked Drex Fleet for us. If you've never played Drex Fleet with only the bomb glove, I don't recommend that either. Because I don't have the Hydro Pack yet, all I can do here is the Hollow Guy's stealth section to get the info bot, and... I'm... I'm never getting a weapon, am I? <laughs> 
Okay, so yeah, this wasn't the unluckiest run I've ever had. A, because I already had more money than I could possibly need thanks to the early metal detector, and B, because I have had a bomb glove only run that lasted most of the game until I found any weapon whatsoever. At least here, I got the world beater pretty early on. But as those of you that have played randomizers before know quite well, the thing that keeps you coming back is that itch to solve problems in novel ways. In Ratchet especially, it's always really, really easy to fall back into using only your favorite weapons once you get them, or knowing which strategies are dominant on which levels, or against enemy X, Y, or Z. It's... It's comfortable, it's safe, and one of the things that really renewed my appreciation during my retrospectives was stepping back and pretending to forget all of that experience and knowledge wherever I possibly could. That's where you start to recognize the stuff that you've just happened to miss for years and years, those little blind spots. And in Ratchet 1's case, one of the huge blind spots that many folks tend to have is that your arsenal is almost a Zelda-esque inventory worth of strategies that are all valid at almost any point in the game. Again, those of you that are familiar with other game randomizers already know this feeling, but turning the entire game into its own meta puzzle is the most tuned in to probably any of these games that I've felt since I was a kid. It obviously almost goes without saying. Not having a weapon experience system means that all of the weapons tend to deal similar levels of damage, that all enemies are going to go down in a handful of hits, and that your earliest weapon is just as, if not more valuable than the last few, depending on the situations in which you can use them. Each weapon solves its own kind of puzzle in this game. So to have to deal with a bomb glove only run is already one fun bit of challenge, but to then also have to navigate Ratchet 1's planets in this almost Metroid-esque snaking pathway, it makes you truly appreciate this first game maybe more than ever before for being so far removed from the games that came after it. A randomizer simply wouldn't work as well in any Ratchet game after Going Commando, and even Going Commando's shift to shooting first, platforming second, wouldn't work nearly as well as this randomizer does. It's part of why there aren't any current plans to build out randomizers for 2 or 3, at least by board plate, because while the possibilities for level order would probably be a bit wider, the core experience wouldn't feel as satisfying. In other words, Ratchet 1, when randomized, almost turns what many see as the game's biggest weaknesses into its greatest strength. And it's such a neat experience, God damn it, I said neat again, seeing how the game treats item progression when things are turned on their head. On one of my earlier runs, I found out that the game just kind of assumes that you have the O2 mask by the time you get to the second to last level, so it never considers running a check and preventing you from walking out into space if you don't. It doesn't think to check if you have the pilot's helmet either. In back-to-back -back sections, the game rightfully assumes that you have the equipment needed, because you could never get this far without said equipment, and that's just a cool little peek behind the scenes into how Insomniac treated the level progression. Now going back to Planet Battalia here, the game forces you over to that level no matter what after you beat the Snaggle Beast, which, by the way, not actually too bad to fight with just the bomb glove. However, there's an info bot in this cutscene here, which means that that itself is also randomized, even if you go to Battalia because the game forces you to. So I hadn't realized it at the time, but I unlocked two levels for the price of one. Although I didn't have the grind boots yet, I could still slam through the main portion of Battalia thanks to the Tesla Claw, and then as a bonus for saving the planet, the plumber gave me the Devastator Rocket Launcher. I, I don't know how he could afford that thanks to socioeconomic disparity, but I went from one weapon to two of the best weapons all in one go. And with the Commando giving us the Infobot for Planet Gaspar, I've got two more weapons that I can pull there to hopefully up my arsenal. I... I mean, here's the thing. At this point in the run, genuinely, the only item I would need to beat the game is the Trespasser, so I could have, on paper, finished Ratchet 1 on this playthrough with, like, 300,000 spare bolts and only four weapons, one being the Taunter, so let's be real, three weapons. And also, it ended up turning out that I got the Trespasser as my very next item when I started going back to planets like Poketaru to clean up, alongside getting three extra health moments later, so that would have been true either way. This game could have been beaten pretty much right at this point in time. However, pretty much every time I've done a randomizer run, I've continued playing. I end up going out of my way to see what the rest of the item roadmap looks like. I love continuing to find those unique different pathways, finding that each run triggers those good brain problem-solving feelings. I love seeing the other little triggers or flags that the team never thought would be manipulated in this way out of order. 
The O2 mask once again is another example. Having that automatically means that the clank section in the outer space part of the Blarg research station is already completed, which means that the walkway is finished. You don't need to play through that whole section as Ratchet to go find out what you got instead of the Hydro Displacer. I love buying the grind boots on this station only for it to be the Hydro Pack, or finishing the grind rail section here on Calibo 3 only to discover that the taxi doesn't show up because I don't have the item that I'm supposed to get here, which is apparently the thing that triggers the taxi, and realizing in both of these moments that I can't even do the most basic loops back to the start of some levels because of the, pardon the pun, wrenches that get tossed into what was originally such a well-oiled machine. That second one, by the way, is the only other time where I had to use the Rackman program to reload myself to the start of the level, only because I was paranoid that saving and then quitting slash reloading in-game might mess up the seed. I love the fear and challenge of having to do the second hoverboard race without the Platinum Zoomerator, meaning that I can't do tricks to earn boost, because my god, you have to be just about perfect to have a shot on this one without the boosts, only for me to be rewarded with an actual rock for my efforts and suffering. As somebody who always looks at how I can take advantage of a game's mechanics or physics and solve problems in unique and stupid ways rather than just the intended one, I should, I should probably be a playtester, honestly, all of this stuff is almost custom crafted for my enjoyment. Like, I really used to hate Ultanis, that clankless level, back when I was a kid, probably because it was really moody and rainy and I was like seven, I, I don't know, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Over time, I came to like it, of course, but having this level recontextualized as the level that can give you, like, five different items right at the start of your run made me fall in love with it. I love seeing that level first now, I love seeing that level in general now, and I know that I would enjoy even my least favorite parts of Ratchet 1 more now that I've experienced them in their purest, most chaotic form. Again, I know that some randomizer aficionados out there will look at a lot of this and think that the point of the video is Baby Discovers First Randomizer, and hey, although I've had my fair share of randomizer or even roguelike experience, that's still a little bit of a fair takeaway. But the things that make this mod click for me are more than just that and mean more than just that. For 15 plus years, I've looked at this game and any subsequent Ratchet as a comfort food, as the kind of thing I could just turn my brain off and vibe with. Even with the newer games, it's always been easy to simply fall into that habit within the very first playthrough because RNC has never exactly changed much, even when it goes for those radical experimental projects. I would love to say that a game like A Rift Apart, or, you know, the actual reimagining of this very game, let me experience the series purely, fully anew with fresh eyes, but as much as those may recontextualize the things that I already love, or they might give me new things to love, you never truly get to have that first experience again. Even as somebody who frequently goes out of my way to play the games I cover in such a way that I can try and emulate that first time player experience, the slower playstyles, observing the scenery more and letting everything breathe, rather than just go, 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 blast through every obstacle in my way, I'm always gonna have those preconceptions going into a new entry in my childhood favorite series. But playing this mod is probably the closest that I could come to doing that in terms of gameplay, because it let me completely turn off my die-hard fan brain, my game analysis brain, and solve new problems. When you have to go through the levels in a way other than intended, it's gonna fire the final two remaining synapses in your brain in a new way, which brings Ratchet 1 back to its original mission statement, the idea that got the first game pitched, and the idea that spawned, what's at this point, the PlayStation brand's Mario. A game about a weird little alien that flies in a spaceship from planet to planet collecting new weapons and gadgets. That was what Ratchet was pitched as. That was the original idea for this game. That's why some levels don't really have a purpose other than to give you more weapons and gadgets. In this case, there's no story or plot to really worry about because it's all out of order. All you're doing is being an explorer, doing Metroidvania search action-y things. If the game were developed any differently, there's a strong chance that this randomizer would too be completely different. The enemy behaviors were often copied and pasted from level to level if enemies were reused in this game in 2 and 3 and onward, meaning that there was no global set of enemies that could easily be randomized like in some other game mods. Because that's just not a possibility until the game inevitably gets leaked and decompiled on PC or something one day, this mod only respects and enhances the base of what made Ratchet 1 so unique, rather than replacing that with a new challenge. 
In every playthrough of this mod, you have to appreciate some of the level design and challenges in a way that you've probably never had to before, rather than everything being turned into pure chaos for the sake of it. The same is true for the gold bolts, where other randomizers would try to add those into the mix and force you to collect potentially every single secret item simply to find the gadgets you need to progress, in turn forcing you to learn higher level exploits to clip through walls or infinite jump or whatever it might be, and making this sort of mod both less accessible to the players that might appreciate it the most, and also making the runs of this randomizer stretch into the 8 to 10 hour range instead of the smooth and breezy, I don't know, 2 to 3 hours they usually are, the changes instead stick to the base scope of the game as intended, where so many other randomizers that I've experienced, and of course not all of the randomizers ever, I should clarify, tend to add a new challenge that moves well beyond the intent or the design thesis of the base game, I don't feel this one does that. And to think, I only found this mod because I was trying to pitch for an optional weapon randomizer mode in Rift Apart or future Ratchet titles by way of an update or whatever it might be, where your guns would randomly swap out every five seconds like in the random arena challenges. Anyway, this is all a lot of words to explain why this mod took me from not even wanting to think about this franchise for a year plus after I finished my retrospective saga, to playing Ratchet 1 more in the span of a couple months than I had in the prior five to six years combined. Mind you, for my video on Ratchet 1 only two years ago, I played that game five times in a row. Yeah. It's the kind of mod that just won't work with any other title in the series, but it's also the kind of mod that I almost feel some of those at the studio should test out. The goal to this day is still to develop games that give kids that sense of exploration and wonder that these early games gave us as children, and although the design philosophies have evolved over time, I think there's value to breaking up the, the, the almost scar tissue that we develop over time from playing these games mostly the same exact way every time. It's retroactively changed how I look at some of the later Ratchet titles, at least on paper. I'll, I'll probably know for sure later this year or in 2024 when I finally have the urge to finish off this video series with the PSP game and the movie and maybe the second Java phone game once that gets finally dumped out online and whatever else might crop up by then. But I, I have a feeling that this has changed how I look at the future Ratchet titles that came after Ratchet 1. To think that the way that I continue to approach these games can keep changing not only after 20 years of playing them, but also after all the times that I played them from a critical lens now in the last couple years. To think that that can continue to evolve and change thanks to a mod of all things, that's wild. And I think that even if you're maybe not the biggest fan of Ratchet 1 because of how differently it plays and how it's a bit dated compared to the later games in the Ratchet series, you should still consider giving this a shot if you're able to. I didn't think I would find a way to enjoy Ratchet 1 any more than I already did, especially after pouring over it again five full times ahead of my retrospectives, and yet, here we are, somebody found a way to get me to gush about this game in a completely new way. So I thank Boardplate and the others that helped make this mod possible for making that happen. Boardplate did also share with me some of the other ideas they've got in store for mods as they get further into the weeds with studying Ratchet 1, and while I can't yet share what they've shown me, when those come out, it's, it's gonna be fun. Until then, I'll find myself coming back again and again to this classic comfort food thanks to some novel seasoning, which I'm incredibly grateful for, because one of the trade-offs of the super fulfilling job of gushing and sharing all of the detailed stories behind these games and introducing more people to this franchise than I ever could have imagined, the trade-off is that my desire to actually play any of the games sort of bottomed out by the time I was done with the two-ish years of constant work and research and all that fun stuff. That, that's not a complaint, I fully expected that going into the project, but it's almost like I finally got sick of pizza, and then boom, somebody reinvented pizza somehow, and now I'm gonna feast again for years and years to come because I love pizza even more now. It also means more people are gonna keep asking me about that goddamn PSP Ratchet video now that I've talked about the series again, so uh, um, maybe, maybe I still am. Sick of pizza. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay golden.